Hello, my name's Terry Roll. I'm a retail manager from assistant manager from Milton Keynes. And in my spare time, I like to give advice to YouTubers who are struggling with tricky games. Terry has a busy life. He wakes up every morning at half past one in the afternoon and prepares himself a nutritious breakfast before heading to work. But it's not until he comes home later in the evening that his real job begins. Well, there are a lot of YouTubers out there who try and play through really tough games and they struggle. And uh, so I feel like I have an obligation to offer moral support. Terry logs in as his YouTube alias NoScopeWizard44 and begins his nightly search for online playthroughs of difficult games. Then, when he finds a gamer that's struggling, he offers this unique, insightful pearl of wisdom. Yeah, got him. What's that? Two more on the Dark Souls 3 video. Okay, I'm on my way. Hello, you've caught me tracking down all of the get good commenters and punching them in the face. But while I've been doing that, I have been thinking, what are those games that force you to get good? You know, the ones that, no matter how good you've got at other games, will still force you to learn and graft and haul your way over the initial difficulty spike until you become competent. Here are seven games you'll never beat unless you get good. Number one, Alundra. Who remembers this PS1 beauty? I do. I remember naively buying it after finishing Final Fantasy VII and craving more epic role-playing adventures starring cartoon people with massive swords. I didn't have a clue what I was getting myself into. It wasn't like Final Fantasy VII. I mean, it was flipping brilliant, don't get me wrong, and eventually I loved it, but Alundra pulled that love out of me, slowly, with one hand, and threw rock-hard puzzles and real-time combat at me with the other. So really, Alundra isn't so much about getting good as getting clever. You spend the majority of your time in this wonderful top-down action RPG thinking, as opposed to smacking things with weapons. Although there is still lots of that, don't worry. So if you want to finish Alundra, you need to want to finish Alundra. This is not a game into which you can casually dip your toes. You need to dive in, brace yourself for the ice cold difficulty and start kicking. Eventually you'll acclimatise and come out the other side a better person, a better gamer, and crucially, as someone who can say, yes, but have you played Alundra? When all your friends start lie boasting about how they beat the Capra Demon on their first try. No, you didn't shut up. Entry 2 is Beautiful Joe, the PS2 version of which was developed by Clover Studio, an independent team founded by Capcom that also made God Hand and Okami before being dissolved, with a few key members going on to found what would eventually become Platinum Games. And if you need me to explain who they are, then go away, you're not welcome here. I'm just kidding. Anyway, I mention the history of the developers to give you an idea of what Beautiful Joe is like, for those of you who've never heard of it. It was fast, it was full of ludicrously over-the-top combat, and it was really, really bloody hard. The kind of game that makes your fingers ache from the continual effort of 
Not Dying. It's a simple game, a pure side-scrolling beat-em-up about a movie buff who gets sucked into the cinema screen and has to defeat enemies using the power of video effects. For instance, you can use slow motion to make dodging easier. But this is the studio that went on to become Platinum Games, remember? The premise may be simple, i.e. kill everything that isn't you, but the execution is anything but. Beautiful Joe's combat was nails, especially on the adult's difficulty level. Perhaps unsurprisingly, I never got that far into Beautiful Joe myself. Instead, I watched a friend play through it, the same friend I'd watched complete the original Devil May Cry, on Dante Must Die mode. That's the kind of level we're talking here. Electric combat, brilliant combat, but combat at which you'll definitely suck initially until you knuckle down and get good. Our third entry is Ninja Gaiden Sigma, a brilliant PS3 action title that, at the time, was the most gorgeous game ever. It was the one you had to own if you were lucky enough to have a PS3 back in 2007. The one you'd put on if you were showing off to all your mates. I was one of those lucky few. I remember taking my PS3 back to uni with me after Christmas and excitedly inviting all my friends over to come and check out the graphics. I'd seen the reviews for Ninja Gaiden Sigma, as solid and sparkling as Ryu Hayabusa's thighs, and so, of course, I splashed out 40 big ones, thank you, student loan, anticipating how awesome I'd look in front of my mates. Here's some expert advice from me to you, just in case you're thinking of playing Ninja Gaiden Sigma in front of a large group of inebriated university students anytime soon. Practice. Don't play this for the first time in front of anyone. You know, I can only liken it to your first driving lesson or something. The game tells you the controls. Press square to attack and L1 to block. In much the same way as your driving instructor tells you to find the bite point and then slowly apply the accelerator. Fine, you think, I can do that. Car crash both literally in that metaphorical scenario and also figuratively in the literal one. That's right. Keep up. If you're not understanding this nonsense I've written, you know, get good. Only the car crash in Ninja Gaiden Sigma takes the form of Ryu slashing wildly at thin air, while agile baddie ninjas somersault behind and cleave his guts out with the kind of power and precision most protagonists would kill for, let alone grunts in the first friggin' area. You cannot hack and slash your way through this, no. You're fighting enemies almost as skillful as you. You need to block, you need to be quick, you need to time it right and then strike like a viper, quickly offing one foe and then preparing to face the next. You need to wall run and wall jump and basically just be an actual ninja, I think. When you do get good, Ninja Gaiden Sigma is a spectacular game to play and watch but you do really need to get good. You know when we mentioned Platinum Games earlier? Well, here's their piece de resistance in at number four, Bayonetta. For my money, the pinnacle of the stylish action genre. No mean feat considering its competition consists of games like Devil May Cry, Vanquish, and Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. Bayonetta is one of those games that makes you look awesome no matter what your skill level, translating simple button inputs into spectacular on-screen results. But Bayonetta is also a game where you can look spectacular and still get your ass handed to you. So to avoid that, you'll need to, yes, get good. The key thing you'll need to learn in Bayonetta is when to dodge. Now, you can spam dodge and get the hell out of dodge like whenever you want. You can play it safe, jabbing a few times and then flipping merrily out of the way, but that's only going to get you so far. If you want to deal big damage, you need to activate Witch Time, a mechanic that effectively puts enemies in stasis and lets you have your wicked way with them. And how do you activate Witch Time? You dodge 
but at the very last second. This takes bravery and no small amount of skill. First off, you'll need to learn your enemy's attacks to get the timing down. Then you'll need to be brave. When you're up against a tough enemy or even a boss, you know that getting hit, especially on hard difficulties, could mean game over almost instantly. So pushing it and waiting to dodge until the last available moment is terrifying. But when you pull it off, oh yes, it's time to let your hair down and crush your foes in true Platinum Games over-the-top fashion. Entry 5 is one for me, so just let me have this, okay? It's one of few games I've properly got good at, and that is Crash Team Racing. Now, don't laugh, you can have a blast in Crash Team Racing without being that good at it. You can win races and blow up your mates and maybe even finish the campaign without being that good at it, but if you want to be the best, if you want to unlock all the characters and beat Oxide's ghosts and collect all the CTR letters and find all the shortcuts, then you need to devote yourself to the ways of the speed boost. Speed boosting is so important in Crash Team Racing. You know, I used to play this game against my sister loads when we were kids and we both got to the stage where the dual shock would just be reverberating with cart power for literally the entire race. You'll know you've got good when you can get through an entire race without once dropping below a basic speed boost. You've got to start with the gridline boost activated by accelerating at just the right moment before the race begins. Then it's on to the power sliding. Hold R1 to begin the drift and then hit L1 whenever your exhaust spits out black fumes for an extra boost. Chain three of these together for a slightly bigger boost. Keep power sliding and remember to press R1 at the apex of every jump for another speed boost when you land. Then there are other tricks like sending bombs and nitro out behind you to avoid homing missiles and catching your rivals unawares by dropping potions inside weapon pickup boxes so they just smash into them without even knowing they're there. I could go on about Crash Team Racing and how I'm the best at it and everything, but there's already a video up on the channel that proves I'm not, so I'll shut up about it now. Street Fighter 4 is our sixth entry, and feel free to sub this out for your fighting game of choice. This entry is purely to illustrate the genre as a whole, and how, if you want to hold your own online against the best of the best, you'll need to get good. Now, I thought I was pretty good at Tekken 3 when I was a kid. You know, I've beat arcade mode with everyone, even Dr. Bosconovic, bring it on. Until I played someone who was actually good and barely got a single hit in over five games. The thing with fighting games, and I'm using Street Fighter 4 as my example because it's the one I suck most at, is that there are so many levels of good you can get. You can get knowing everyone's moves good. You can get reading what other people are going to do and reacting accordingly good. And then there's this other level, this plane of existence above all the rest, inhabited by people who've basically plugged themselves in to their favoured fighting game and play nothing else ever. These people feel the game. They don't look at the controller, you know, they don't think, oh, I'll do this combo now. They just act like their on-screen avatar is an extension of their mind. I played a bunch of fighting games against people at EGX this year and lost almost all of them. I beat Dave, obviously. And the one that sticks in my mind is this game of Dead or Alive 6. Ravel here, the man in the red YouTube jacket, is really good at Dead or Alive 6. But there was a moment I was sure I'd KO'd you. And then you countered and reversed me like it was nothing and it was so good I had to shake your hand. That is feeling it level. That's getting good at fighting games. Final entry, and I've gone for Bloodborne, my favourite of the Soulsborne titles. 
for its beautifully grotesque aesthetic, its incredible character design, and the fact its combat system took everything Dark Souls players knew and turned it upside down. You had to unlearn so many Dark Souls survival skills to get good at Bloodborne. Here was a game that rewarded aggression and proactivity, drawing you into offensive play by replenishing your health if you attacked quick enough, turning what would usually be block into an attack as well. Countershotting. What a brilliantly cruel thing to ask you to do. Basically, you need to shoot enemies with your gun just as they're attacking you. This will stun them, giving you a window of opportunity to slice them up good. It feeds into a combat system that's quick, lean and violent, one that favours sharp bursts of action as opposed to the more defensive, considered approach of Dark Souls. Much like Bayonetta, it's a risk-reward system with a sharp drop-off on either side. You know, if you attempt a counter shot and miss, you're well on your way to being dead. But if you nail it, you feel like an absolute badass. And if you get good, you'll nail it time after time after time. I even managed one on Father Gascoigne and was very proud of myself. So there we are, seven games you'll never beat unless you get good. Good. Let us know what your picks would be in the comments, give us a like if you enjoyed the video, and hit that notification bell to make sure you never miss a Friday feature. Thanks for watching, and see you next week. For the players.